I think anybody who was around at that time will remember the sound of Sputnik, the bleep, bleep, bleep that we heard, I think in my case, on the radio. It's impossible now to imagine the buzz that that created, the first human-made object in space. The space race had begun. In 1959, the USA invited other countries to work with them. Within three years, the first international satellite, Ariel 1, was almost ready for liftoff from Cape Canaveral. Its cargo? Six UK experiments that would change our understanding of Earth's atmosphere forever. We did an amazing amount between the approval of the payload in 1959 and the launch in 1962. And we all understood that we were in something quite exceptional. It was a tremendously exciting period. It was a feeling of intense pressure, intense challenge, but welcomed because the road was open. We knew we were going somewhere. I really think uh, that they were visionary. They could really uh, try something that, that was uh, completely new and novel, take the risk for it, and uh, they, they clearly couldn't afford any failure. A week or so before the aerial launch, an Atlas launcher blew up on the pad. Now, 100 tonnes of rocket fuel exploding is quite a sight. And thinking of your experiments sitting in the middle of that explosion is a somewhat sobering thought. Nerves were shaken further when the rocket's control system developed a fault, delaying liftoff for three weeks. Then, with the countdown started, NASA's lighting started to play havoc with the satellite's information systems. So we had a hectic debate with the designer of the system, and it was a damp evening and he thought it was electrical interference. So we turned the lights off, and my golly, the uh, encoders started to work properly. So with all of that background and the fact that we were investing several years of our lives in this, you can imagine that when the thing finally did clear the launcher and go up into the blue sky, we were pretty pleased with all of that. For me, it was finally the UK doing something in space and it gave me a sense of I could get involved, which I hadn't had before that. An incredible 50-year journey had started. Vanden Air Force Base. Being raised to launching position, Aerial 3, first all-British designed and built satellite. In the underground blockhouse, the elaborate countdown and control. Everything a perfect success. Aerial 3 is now in orbit, about 340 miles high, sending back the intended scientific data. But as always, the final seconds before blast-off were tense and anxious. Nothing went wrong. A launch out of the textbook. In 1971, the UK showed that it didn't have to rely on other countries to get into space when Black Arrow became the first UK rocket to launch a UK satellite. Prospero was significant simply because it was the first time a country other than the US or the USSR had launched something using their own rocket and their own spacecraft into space. That put the UK at the time into a rather special club. Throughout the 1970s, UK skills were helping to transform global communications throughout the European space programme. And then, in 1986, a truly historic moment. A UK-built spacecraft went to the heart of an iconic object in our skies, Halley's Comet. I believe Giotto was of critical importance to European space science. It was the first really ambitious mission which Europe, through ESA, did on its own. And it really made an impact. And it was a daring mission. It aimed to go just some 600 kilometers from the heart of Halley's Comet. And that had never been achieved. We'd never seen what was at the center of, of a comet. Hubble, our first astronaut, even the loss of Beagle 2 on its mission to Mars were all remarkable achievements. And then, in 2005, 
the remarkable finale to an eight-year journey when a largely British-made probe touched down on Saturn's moon, Titan. There was such a release of emotion in the control room. Uh, I remember it to this day. I will remember it till the day I die. It was 15 years of blood, sweat and tears that came to fruition. And, you know, there was many a time when we thought we would get nothing out of it. But when we realised we'd gone through that perilous descent and landing on the surface and we were getting real live scientific data, I, I have to say I disappeared into the corner and shed a few tears. Like Sputnik and the Apollo moon landings before it, the mission to Titan provided powerful material for scientists who wanted to use space to inspire young people. When the Huygens probe entered Titan's atmosphere, it's not just physics that we're looking at. If we wanted to understand the dynamics of what was going on in Titan's surface, amazingly, we see parallels with what's going on geographically on the Earth's surface because we've got a world which has got rivers and lakes of methane and ethane. And so what I found in my experience is that there are so many inspirational contexts from space science that can be used, and I have used, with students at all sorts of levels. And I think that's one of the most powerful driving forces that we can use space in education for. 50 years of investment in UK space science are now delivering benefits for everyone. I think people are so used to using space, they don't even think that space is involved. I used GPS to find my way here today. I was using space, but I wasn't thinking about it as I was doing it. So many people do that every day of their lives. It's paying back for the money invested originally in things like Ariel 1. This story is going to carry on where the next generation of scientific missions are going to push the, the technology, what we need to answer the scientific questions, but the technology we create will then come back into everyday applications. The UK space family continues to earn praise for the excellence of its research, instrumentation and engineering. As we look to the future, it's winning more and more export orders too. The space industry in the UK is worth over £7 billion to the UK economy. We reckon it's already employing 20,000 people and it impacts on another 80,000 jobs or so. And that is definitely going to grow. The seeds of these new opportunities were sown 50 years ago. Sir Isaac Newton once said that if he'd seen further than others, it's because he was standing on the shoulders of giants. And that's the way I look at some of the early pioneering work that was done. What was achieved using technologies that we regard as virtually obsolete nowadays is absolutely incredible. And I think it's fair to say if we hadn't had such firm foundations set five decades ago, uh, we would not have even started this journey of transformation that we've seen in terms of what we've discovered about the universe and in terms of understanding our role on planet Earth and the effect that we're having. Most critically, it is data from space that is helping to explain just what we might be doing to our fragile environment. A lot of what we know about the changing planet is coming from long-term observations, things like the sea surface temperature, how thick are the ice sheets and are they changing? Yes, they are. Uh, and all this kind of know-how is feeding into basic questions like what are we going to do about energy generation? How are we, are we going to cope with rising sea level in the future? So they're important on a global scale as well as a personal level. UK space science is now looking outside our solar system to learn more about our home. Plans are at an advanced stage for a £400 million European project called ECHO, which will study hundreds of so-called exoplanets. The idea behind ECHO is to look at the atmosphere of planets which are very far away, planets orbiting other stars, not our own sun. And uh, with ECHO we might be able to, to look at uh, the composition and the thermal properties of this planet and in some cases even work out whether they're, they're habitable or not. For world leaders like Giovanna Tinetti, the collaboration between public research and private industry means that the UK is now the place to be. 
I think I arrived uh, in the UK in the right moment uh, uh, because with the formation of the UK Space Agency, um, they can really do a fantastic work in uh, trying to put together the interests of scientists like myself uh, with the uh, expertise and interest of the industrial partners. The significance of the creation of the United Kingdom Space Agency shouldn't be underestimated. It's a complete change in the way that UK space activity is organised. It's been a golden opportunity in terms of raising the profile of space activities in the UK. And I don't mean within the space science community, I mean to within the science community and the public as a whole. The UK has an exciting future in space, but those working in it know they owe a huge debt of gratitude to the pioneers of the past. I, th I think it's really important to commemorate Ariel 1 because of the excitement of the dawn of the space age and it's really important to give a new energy to what we're doing in, in space. The UK Space Agency is part of that. There are many new companies bringing space to everyday lives, uh, but also the things that there are to explore that are left to do are going to keep us busy in the next 50 years quite happily. <laughs>